Hello, InstaFam. It's Dr. T here. And it's a rather chilly Wednesday night here in Perth. I am coming to you a little later than I had planned. Uh, but that's because uh, the dog was staring at me with his beautiful big brown eyes saying, please, mummy, take me for a walk. <laughs> so I had to. So now that that job is done, and I've got to tell you, it was cold out there. Super chilly. I believe my friends on the East Coast are doing it even tougher than me. But um, yeah, I pulled out the old beanie. So I got a little bit of PTSD putting the beanie on, I must say. Make sure that I can sort of pull out that I actually do have some hair under this beanie. <laughs> but anyway, here I am. So we have a few questions that have pop, been popped through on DM. And listen, I want to make it really clear. These live Q&A sessions are for one purpose and one purpose only. And that is to provide you guys with a little bit more food for thought that is evidence-based and uh, empowers and educates you. I'm not here to solve anyone's uh, fertility journey because I can't do that in a social media context uh, and I can't do that uh, answering a two or three line post. So the purpose is to pop into the comments any questions that you may have, make them short and sweet, don't need your whole life story, certainly won't be solving your medical problems tonight and every little piece of advice that I might give on here must be underlined by you heading over to a qualified fertility specialist to discuss your particular case. So one of the questions that has come down, uh, what are my thoughts around thawing out embryos and performing PGT for aneuploidy on them in the case of recurrent implantation failure? So, um, recurrent impl implantation failure, to those who don't know, is where you, de the definition is where you have transferred three or more morphologically normal or presumably normal embryos and no pregnancy has occurred. So, the, the problem with defining normal is that there's lots of different ways we can define an embryo as being normal. Does it look normal? Does it look pretty under the microscope? Does it have sort of a three to five AA grading as per the Gardner system? Uh, is it chromosomally normal? Uh, is it metabolically normal? Do we know that sort of from a mitochondrial health point of view, uh, it's a robust and healthy embryo? And so many of those things are not necessarily easily answerable, nor do the research studies necessarily compare like with like. So this remains an area of debate. But the definition of the transfer of three presumably normal embryos without pregnancy is recurrent implantation failure. So what this person has asked is, well, I've got some embryos frozen. Should I thaw them out and do pre-implantation genetic testing to see if they're chromosomally normal, i.e. do they have all the right number of chromosomes? Because as we know, the most common reason why a pregnancy, sorry, why an embryo doesn't implant or rather miscarriages is because it's not chromosomally normal. So we want to know that we're putting back a chromosomally normal embryo into the endometrium. And if it's still not sticking, well, it's probably therefore more likely to be an endometrial receptivity issue. So you can start to narrow down the causes of recurrent implantation failure. And most people agree that genetically tested or doing PGT on embryos is a fairly robust process. However, what happens if you are thawing out an embryo, you are biopsying it, then you are refreezing it, so it's a twice frozen embryo, and then waiting for the biopsy results to come back. Is that a problem? Does that cause harm to the embryos? Well, some studies do suggest that twice frozen embryos have, they do have a lower implantation and lower pregnancy rate. Um, some Studies, however, say, no, actually, if you're biopsying a good-looking embryo uh, in a lab with good vitrification techniques, then the embryo is not 
at significant harm. However, there is always the possibility that an embryo could be harmed by the biopsy process itself. So I don't think we can put hand on heart and say twice freezing and biopsying embryos, uh, it's going to not affect the embryo at all. I don't think we can put our hand on our heart and say that, but um, I don't think it probably causes as much harm as we think it used to. So hopefully that helps to answer that question. Whether or not you would biopsy just those embryos um, and transfer them or whether you would thaw them out and develop a whole new batch in a new IVF cycle and then biopsy them all together, that's certainly something I would recommend discussing with your fertility specialist and is entirely up to you and them. But hopefully, hopefully I've been able to answer that question. Now, in the interim, I'm hoping there might be some more questions. There's certainly been a lot of people jump on. Maybe some of you have jumped back off again. Oh, look, hello, Amy Colton, uh, Emma Clark, Natty T, Shannon O'Neill, Life of Brit, always good to have you on. Uh, Miracle Skin Clinic, hello, hello. Are there any questions? Any questions, any questions? I know a lot of people are eagerly waiting our webinar next Tuesday night. So while I'm sitting here, I'm going to give it a little bit of a plug. So next Tuesday, the 25th of June at 6 p.m. Perth time, 8 p.m. Brisbane time, I will be collabing with Charlie Health, which is the amazing new AI-driven um, app that I have um, started to use. It's a sensational um, app to use for menstrual tracking, for determining um, any particular women's health issues, looking at things like pelvic pain, uh, perimenopause. We are in the process of developing a fertility module, which is going to be amazing. Uh, and there's plenty of other things on the horizon for Charlie Health. But next week, I am linking arms with the amazing Dr. Claudia, uh, from Charlie Health, who is a women's health GP on the East Coast. And we are going to be talking about polycystic ovarian syndrome. And we're going to be doing a little Q&A session. So keep an eye out, 6 p.m. next Tuesday, the 25th, 6 p.m. Perth time or 8 p.m. Brisbane time or East Coast time. Uh, and we would love you to jump on and take part in our Q&A, our live Q&A. Okay, Tyus, hello, hello. How are you, my friend? Susie Spain is on. Nobody has put any questions in. What the? You got, ah, oh, here we go, Natty, two. I'm sure you've already answered this previously, so never mind if you have. How high on priority would you place CoQ10 pre-egg collection? Um, all right, so Co, good question, by the way. Coenzyme Q10 is... A, an element of the electron transport chain. What is that, Tamara? The electron transport chain is part of the metabolic processing within the mitochondria. What is the mitochondria? The mitochondria are the little organelles that provide all of the energy for the functioning of the egg. So they're super important. And we have lots of mitochondria in our cells. And Something that we know is as an egg ages, so too does the mitochondrial functioning. And with aging mitochondria, you don't get very good metabolic processing. And so even if that egg is genetically or chromosomally normal, doesn't mean that you get a very good embryo quality. So the point of coenzyme Q10 is to help improve egg quality and subsequently embryo quality. Now, would I necessarily think that coenzyme Q10 is useful for a 32-year-old who is going through IVF? No, probably not. I think the role of coenzyme Q10 is probably in the older woman, in the older egg. Uh, that's where its function is probably best useful. Do I have any hardcore evidence for that? No, of course I don't. <laughs> evidence on supplements is always thin on the ground. Um, so I can't say for sure there's been no randomized double-blind controlled trial that shows, yes, older women should be taking coenzyme Q10 to create better embryos. I can't say that for sure. But what I do know is that it's probably not a harmful substance. 
And so because I know that it's unlikely to be harmful, maybe it might do some good, I would recommend it to women who are older prior to going through an egg collection. Bikini Krill, cool handle. What impact can treatment protocol have on egg quality? Lots. Um, so when you are stimulating to get good follicle growth, um, you require FSH receptors and you require FSH. So many of you would take that in the form of drugs like Puragon or Gonal F. Um, some people are deficient in LH as well, and so they might take additional drugs like Luverus or drugs that combine the two, such as uh, Pergaverus or even Menopure that has HMG that acts in, um, in replacement of, of LH. So the type of, I guess, drugs that you're stimulated with will affect how the follicle is stimulated and how the follicle is stimulated affects how the egg grows during that two weeks of stimulation. It also matters if your fertility specialist kind of hyper stimulates you too much and has to start to pull back on their medication because of a risk of OHSS. We know that um, coasting, which is where you stop dosing, you stop giving any medication and just like coast, uh, generally speaking, the egg quality will be poorer. Um, sometimes too, dropping the dosing can lead to a poorer cohort of eggs as well. So yes, treatment can impact egg quality. Uh, we know the type of trigger that is used. For example, in uh, women who are quite LH deficient, giving them a decapeptal trigger, you probably won't get good egg maturity. So absolutely, how you are treated will affect your egg quality in subsequent pregnancy. And that's why IVF can be as diagnostic as it is therapeutic. Often we learn things about our patient that then encourages us to change our treatment protocol. Funny that. Right, who else has a question? Lib Start, 1987. I'm having my first FET likely in August. Any tips or prep? Oh, guys out there who've had more than one FET, frozen embryo transfer, any, any tips for Libstar 1987? The first thing I would say is having an embryo transfer is probably not the time to make any radical lifestyle changes. I've said this before, you know, it's not the time to start on a bio-organic diet or pick up CrossFit classes. It's not the time to, you know... Um, doing any big career moves. It's not the time to be traveling all over the world. You just want to be doing life very moderately. I probably wouldn't drink and I definitely wouldn't smoke <laughs> doing a frozen embryo transfer. But um, the idea is you want to live a fairly moderate life. Equally, I don't think there's any point in uh, wrapping yourself in cotton wool either. So, you know, if you're the sort of person that likes to get out and do some exercise and, you know, sexual intercourse is a really important part of this process, then no one's telling you not to. So just be normal. That's the biggest piece of advice I can give you. Live a moderate life and be normal. Good luck. Good luck, good luck. Any other questions? Any other questions? Lucy Karate's on. Georgie Hart, hello, hello, Laura Jane. Amelia Claire, adenomyosis, just got this diagnosis after six failed transfers. Oh, you poor thing. So there you go, recurrent implantation failure. Have you seen pre-treatment make a difference in outcomes? I certainly have. And I would certainly recommend it, of course, depending on the severity of adenomyosis. So this is a discussion for you to have with your fertility specialist. But um, there is a school of thought that long down regulation with medications like Zolidex, uh, there's a new one on the market, Ryoko, um, may actually improve that sort of um, endometrial environment and therefore improve implantation. So yes, I have seen it make a difference. But as I said, your individual story, go chat with your fertility specialist about it. Lipstar. Oh, congratulations, fresh transfer. Let's hope the fit is as good. All right. Oh, 
Are there any other questions? M Rock has joined us. Anina Perry has. Mm -mm -mm. Don't think so. Hey, that's not too bad. I got away pretty scot free. I must say, I'm starting to overheat now. <laughs> this was great outside, but uh, I think I'm. I think I'm now having a hot flush. So, on that note, I am hoping to see you guys next Tuesday night. Next Tuesday night at 6 p.m. Perth time, 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. We will be talking about all things PCOS, Q&A sessions. So save up your questions. I'll see you next Tuesday night. And then following that, have I got some good news for you. A little competition for all of my community coming up. So I will see you there. Bye.